Rio de Janeiro. With a big man. Welcome to Frio de Janeiro. This is a big man. Our guest on the show is Karishma Ali from Chitral in northwest Pakistan. Karishma is an inspirational and pioneering athlete who has represented Pakistan in soccer at the Jubilee Games and AFL at the AFL International Cup. Yes, you heard me right. Australian rules football. So we have a very good conversation about how she overcame a lot of barriers to excel in those sports. She's the first woman from her part of the country to go on to play at this level. Using her platform and hero status, Karishma founded the groundbreaking Chitral Women's Sports Club. Her talents have seen her featured on Forbes Asia's 30 Under 30 list in 2019, Milan Fashion Week, she's had a royal meeting with Prince William and Kate Middleton, and she's also on the National Youth Council established by Prime Minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan. And I haven't even mentioned yet that Karishma is only 22 years old. I definitely use the word amazing quite a lot in this conversation. (laughs) In terms of audio quality, it might not be Hollywood standard because we aren't coming to you from Cushy Studios. The Frio de Janeiro family knows that uh, we've had guests live from Brazil, Russia, Jamaica, and Karishma speaking from Islamabad in Pakistan. Before we get into it, just a reminder that show notes from this chat are on abidimam.com. And thanks to Tim Shibley and Sightbeat for setting me up with a really sweet website to call home for the podcast. Make sure to check out Sightbeat to set up a great looking website and online store. Let's kick off the main event. Karishma Ali, it's an absolute pleasure to have you join me on Frio de Janeiro. I want to just start by saying how you came onto my radar and basically... Australia and New Zealand are bidding for the FIFA Women's World Cup in 2023. So I was on the FIFA website, just checking out some of the news, seeing what's going on. And then I saw this amazing picture of these children playing with an amazing mountain backdrop in the, in the, in the background. And then I clicked on that and it was a story about yourself and your history playing football for Pakistan, the amazing work you're doing in the northern regions in your hometown, Chitral. I love to just start by asking you about that region and what it's like growing up there. Well, I want to start by saying thank you for having me on your uh, podcast. That is, um, and yeah, I mean, uh, I grew up in Chitral. It is a um, it is a town in the north of Pakistan, in the province of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. Very beautiful. It's my favorite place in the entire world. Um, I mean, if you want to get the closest to nature is when you would like to visit Chitral because it's all, you know, nature, mountains, you know, clean water, trees, you know, all the good things. And uh, so growing up in Chitral was very different for me than what it is now because we, uh, I grew up without technology. We didn't have a lot of technology. People didn't even have television. So whatever we learned was what we were learning from what we saw around us. And we didn't know what was, you know, in the outside world. Uh, but things are very different now. There's internet, there's, you know, television, and yeah. What's the population of Chitral? And if you can maybe talk to us about the different languages that are spoken. I've heard the fact that some of the roads there are very difficult to navigate. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not too sure about the population, but it could be around something like 500,000 um, people and I think it's uh, men versus women like the ratio of the population is almost the same um, and about the geography yes it's uh, like because it's high in the north there are mountains most of these valleys within Chatral are like inside the mountains so when you have to reach these valleys you have to take really dangerous roads that most people don't like taking uh, for instance uh, my friend uh, an Italian designer Stella Jean she came to visit Chitral and the whole time she was freaking out on the road because the thing is you don't see uh, the road it's so small that just the two tires of the car fit and then below is like a steep mountain so it's really scary um, there is a, I mean, there is diversity within Chitral. We have different kinds of people. We have the Thans, we have the Chitralis, and we have the Kalash. I mean, they are all Chitrali, but they speak different languages, and they have 
uh, sort of a different culture and especially Kalash who are, uh, I mean, they are the reason for tourism in Chitral. A lot of people come in. I don't know if you've ever seen or heard of them, but they're this beautiful community, very colorful and, you know, they're just really beautiful people. And overall, I think Chitralis are known for their hospita- hospitality. And that's why a lot of people love coming to Chitral, visiting the area, you know, interacting with people. Yeah. I do want to talk about your father because when you speak about your introduction to sports, he was a very important part in that. And you can see it in the way you speak about it. Just mention uh, your, the influence your father has had in your life. Uh, he is my hero and he is the reason why I am, I mean, who I am today. And he's played a great role in that and in building up my confidence and pushing me to become this person that I am today. Um, I mean, he's always been different. I, he, his work has inspired me to do what I'm doing today. He basically built the first English medium school in uh, Chitral, in our area of Chitral. And then to, uh, you know, make sure that girls were also getting the same education. What he did was that if someone brought their son into, you know, the school, uh, he was not allowed to get admission if he had a little sister back home who was not coming to school. Right. So he made this law a rule that, you know, if you have a daughter and a son, both of them are coming to school. And then he um, many of the girls study for free. And that's how. Now, a lot of the girls actually are doing way better than the boys back home. And especially in our area, they're like much better. They're doctors, engineers, you know, going abroad for university. And the boys are comparatively not doing so well. So, so yeah, like I see my, my dad's work and I get so inspired. And that's why, I, you know, I've become the person that I am today. He's such a kind-hearted man. You're in Islamabad at the moment as we speak to you, which is the capital of Pakistan. What's the journey yeah. like to get from Chitral to Islamabad? So there's two different routes you could take. Either you go uh, by air or you take, uh, you know, I'm if you're talking about the, the real journey and not, <laughs> not ex- the <laughs> real journey. Else. Yeah. So uh, you, you could go by road. It's just about eight hours drive from Islamabad to uh, Chitral. And then by flight, you can take a flight and it's a 45 minutes flight. Is it a bumpy road or is it a clear highway when, so that's it easy? Is, it is actually a really good road from Islamabad to uh, Chitral. There's motorways, you know, it's really nice. It's not bad. I want to talk to you now about soccer and how you were introduced to the game. I understand it was the 2006 World Cup, watching with yeah. your father. I mean, yeah. we all remember our first World Cup, don't we? How how oh, you, we as a kid, and um, I'm interested in which matches you were watching and what were your impressions of that tournament? It's hilarious because I was uh, supporting Brazil back then and I remember uh, Brazil lost half the way and they were going back home and I cried all night and then in the morning I'm waking up and I'm like what a weirdo like what was I doing I was just really sad uh but yeah I was around eight or nine uh I did not know a lot about football but then uh my father he's such a football fan and he's such a sports fan so he was watching the world cup and he was like I think he was getting bored that there was no one around him watching it with him. So he would make me sit and then explain the whole game to me and be like, oh, this is happening, that is happening. And then I just started loving the game myself and that's how I became a football fan. You know, Brazil played against Australia in that tournament and that was a huge event for me because it was our first World Cup that Australia had made in 32 years. So um, we lost to Italy and I started crying as well. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I know, it's crazy. Who were your favorite players for Brazil? Back then? Yeah. Ronaldinho, of course. He was my favorite, of, you know, he was my first favorite and he was my first crush. He was. He just was such a joy to watch, wasn't he? He was always smiling, but he was yeah, yeah. so skillful. And his game, his game, I think he is, well, you know, his game is the reason why I started loving football. He's so skillful. He makes it look so beautiful and so easy. Absolutely. So now that's that has inspired you. So what what are your memories of first having a football at your feet? I was 
I think it was also after the World Cup is then when I got really excited and it's really funny because I'll go back to my room, I'll blow up a balloon and then I'll try to do the bicycle kick. <laughs> and then every time my mom's like, what's that sound? I'm like, nothing, nothing, because the whole bed would be shaking. <laughs> uh, but then, yeah, but then I, uh, I would go to picnics and my dad would, you know, play football. So then he didn't have anyone playing with him. So then I would be the one playing with him. Uh, I would just love, you know, playing. And I think I was just really sporty since I was a kid. That's what my father says, you know, because uh, for a girl back then, I mean, I knew how to kick the ball properly without having any knowledge, just watching, you know, the game. And I just loved and it give, gave me the feeling of freedom, you know, to be able to play and, you know, and it's like, I don't know, I just forget about everything else when I'm playing football and when I have the football on my feet. What what is special is that you were one of the only girls playing at that time. So yeah. what was the response to that? Back then I wasn't playing the same way I did after I moved to the city. Back then I was just with my dad, so no one really knew that I was playing football, and it was just you know what you know. Uh, um, no one really knew, so nothing really happened. But then later on, when I moved to Islamabad, is then when I started playing football. But then. Even then, my father told me that, you know, for the longest time, no one knew because my, that's why my dad did. My dad was like, if people, you know, get to know, they're just going to create trouble for you. So just do whatever you want to do. Don't, don't discuss it with people. Don't put it out on social media for people to see. Just enjoy it for yourself. I just couldn't hear the last bit there, but that's fine. So your father, it was difficult for him because he's asking you to, mm-hmm. to keep it secret, which must have been really difficult. Yeah. How are you feeling about that? I mean, back then I understood what he meant because our society, so so our culture in Tibral is very similar to those are the areas around us. For instance, we border with Bir and then we also border with Afghanistan. So it's almost the same, almost not really now things are getting better and it's very different, but the culture is almost similar where, uh, you know, girls have certain responsibilities and, you know, they have to follow certain rules. The, you know, uh, and customs. And so I understood that. And when my father told me, I mean, I love my father and I understood that he, you, you know, he meant, you know, he was worried for my safety and that is exactly why he wanted me to, you know, keep quiet and not talk about what I was doing. So yeah, I understand that. And I understood it the moment the word was out and, you know, when I got attacked by people, I understood it, what he meant. So what were the attacks like and how did that word come out then? So in 2016, there were these uh, international jubilee games that was taking place in Dubai. And, you know, Pakistan was forming a team for football for girls uh, that would take part in the in the tournament. And so I, you know, went and I went for the trials and I got selected for the team. And that is, I think, also because of the trials, there were a lot of different people around and someone got to know about me. So one day I wake up early morning and I see my face, I check my Facebook and I have around a hundred notifications, so many friend requests. And I was so scared, like what has happened? Did someone hack into my account or what is going on? Then I checked this post and it is a post uh, from one of the pages that, uh, from my hometown, something in Chitral. And they say that, you know, the heading says that Karishma Ali is the first girl from Chitral to be playing, you know, football professionally and, you know, representing Pakistan internationally. And, like, I checked the comments and I, I was shaking. I was so scared because there are these men that are saying, you know, horrible, horrible things. And as a, as a 17, 18 years old, it's so hard to see something like that, even though I knew what, you know, what I was doing and the consequences. But I'm still, you're never ready for something like that. Things like, oh, she should be killed before she comes back home. Then there's these people cursing my parents and telling them they should die. Yeah, horrible direct, you know, messages or, you know, people threatening me. And I was, you know, I was so scared that I almost gave up in that moment. But it was also then my father, and then I also, you know, kept pushing myself. And my father kept reminding me, do you not see what the post is saying, that you're the first girl, you know, from Chital doing this? And imagine if you gave up today, that there would be no other girl that would ever dare to, you know, do something different and, you know, uh, do something that they want to do in life. So you have to be brave and keep going. And so I did. And... Well, they they tried to stop me, but I didn't stop, and I just multiplied, I guess. 
what kept you sane through that? Because online bullying and and the vicious nature of the words online, I mean, what kept you strong? I mean, you mentioned your dad, but also within yourself. For days and days and days, I'd been crying. For days and days, I was just crying because I was really scared. I talked to different friends of mine who were trying to, you know, push me and try to keep me motivated. But nothing really helps until and unless you push yourself and you tell yourself, you know, how important what you're doing is and how important your work is. And it's not just for yourself, but you have to keep fighting for everyone else, all the other girls back home who have a dream to do something in life. And that's what kept me going. You won a silver medal in at the Jubilee Games in Dubai, so congratulations yeah. on that. And Thank you. And what position do you play and who do you support as well? Uh, so I, I play different positions depending on what match we're playing. I also play defense, then I also play on the right wing. Um, but, uh, oh, what team I support? Is it for the football clubs or the countries? We know that you like Brazil, so how about football club? <laughs> Uh, football clubs, I am such a Barcelona fan and I've been a Barcelona, like Barca fan since I was a kid. I mean, I watched Messi when he was little with that funny hair. I started <laughs> watching since, since then. I was such a big Messi fan. And my dad used to be a Manchester United fan. It's really funny. But then he watched Messi's game and then he started becoming a Messi fan. And then he would just keep watching the Barcelona games all the time. Are you seeing football in Pakistan uh, start to grow? Because I know in India next door there's new professional competitions and there's there's so many people in those in both of those countries. It's just like a sleeping giant of football. So what's happening yeah. there? In Pakistan it's different. It's going down and it's collapsing. Things are really bad right now. Uh, since 2014 we've, we haven't had like proper national you know, competitions. It happened uh, twice uh, in 2018 and 19, but they weren't the same. No international tournaments for the women's team. Uh, you know, there's, I don't know, it's just a whole mess in the management and, you know, the, the whole management higher level, they're fighting on who becomes the president and whatnot. And the players are the ones who are actually suffering really bad because they haven't had, you know, proper, proper training, they haven't had proper tournaments. And... I we're, we're going down, we're doing the opposite of what India is doing. And I think India is doing such an amazing job when it comes to sports and especially football. You know, it's amazing. They're, they're hosting the under-17 Women's World Cup, I think. They sure are. And I think they have been hosting a few different FIFA tournaments yeah. as well. Um, I, I do remember reading that Luis Figo and a few other big former footballers actually travelled to Pakistan last year, it yeah. might have been. But then yeah. hardly many people went because there was not much publicity about it. Are you aware of this? No, I did not go there. And I think uh, it's great that they're coming in, into Pakistan. But then again, in Pakistan, yeah, I mean, instead of spending so much money on bringing these football stars to Pakistan, why don't you invest into grassroots level, you know, football academies or, you know, other things like that? Why don't you work on your sports locally inside your country and work on your athletes rather than bringing these international people, you know. I mean, you bring them here and what are they seeing? Where are they going? You're not taking them to local academies. You're not, you know, the players are not meeting them. So I don't see any use of it. I completely agree. And the sustainability of it is to put yeah. money into developing your own talent. Is there a yeah. women's league or has there been a women's football league in Pakistan? We have the national championship that happens once a year, but... Uh, it didn't happen since 2014, and there was a four four years gap, and then it happened in 2018, and then it happened in 2019. But then, you know, they, after the national championship, they have these team of girls that they select for the national camp. I was selected again in 2018, but it never happened. This is what happens, and I think it's really unprofessional. And we are really looking forward to a big change in the, you know, football federation so that so that the new generation has some hope because a lot of the players are losing hope. A lot of the younger generation is also quite losing hope, seeing that there is no future for football in Pakistan. After becoming a national team player and going back to Chitral, I'd like to talk about how you started the Chitral Women's Sports Club and the, some of the clinics you were running at the very beginning and how that evolved into what you're doing now. 
So I uh, I started back. I I'm a strong believer of giving back to the society. I'm always like you know if if we don't work collectively, like if we don't work together to uh, you know for the development of our area, not one the government single handedly won't do anything. And you know that's why I believe that all of us should you know work together to give back to our community uh, in order to develop. So I uh, I started at the age of um, 12 or 13. I would go back to my hometown and give free English classes. And that's where, you know, with the volunteerism or the social work started building up. And after my experience in 2016 from the, uh, from the Jubilee Games, I just realized what sports can give you. And it's just more than just going playing in the field. It gives you recognition. It gives you so much more. And this is exactly what I wanted to give back to the girls in my hometown because I knew that they have the talent. And I did not feel proud of being the only girl in Chitra playing football because I knew the talent back home is just that they were not given the same opportunity. And I thought it was, you know, my responsibility, even though I was an O level uh, or an A level student and I barely had anything and I barely had the finance to do something. But I wanted to, you know, uh, you know, start something. And uh, in 2016, when I came back from the Jubilee Games, I just took a ball football. I went back home. Then I collaborated with my father's school and then I wanted uh, to, you know, organize football camps uh, for just a week to see what it was and how how parents welcomed it, uh, whether they liked the idea or not. And I was very surprised to see that a lot of the girls the next morning came with proper football kits and I asked if they already had it and they were like, no, I, I borrowed it from my brother or my dad <laughs> brought it for me. And so that excitement just, you know, built the idea that I should, you know, start something properly for these girls, especially. Um, and then in 2018, I started the Chitra Women Sports Club. It was just a whole idea. People laughed at me when I shared my idea. Of course, uh, I would go around looking for sponsors or for donations and people would just be laughing, you know, like, you're doing something like this in Chitral, it's ridiculous. First, it's not going to help. Secondly, you're going to get yourself killed. This is what I heard all the time. Um, but I never gave up. I'm, I'm not a person who gives up. So I, I discussed it with a friend of mine in the U.S. He really liked the idea and he really helped me build up the whole uh, you know, NGO, the whole sports club. And then we organized, we, uh, you know, uh, organized the football camp in 2018. This was, this was the first time that there was a football camp for girls happening in Chitral. To my surprise, we had 60 participants. Now, I had 20 forms uh, printed. These were participation and participant forms. And I thought maybe five or six would come up, you know, what, who knows. And then, so I didn't really think about bringing another coach inside. I was like, I'll coach the five girls, it's fine. But then the next, you know, I gave out the 20 forms and then the next day I have 60 forms and I'm like, how is this possible? So apparently these girls were taking it, scanning it, photocopying it and making their own forms. And I thought that was just really sweet. So I was like, OK, fine, I'll do it. And then we had 60 girls participating in the you know, uh, football camp. We had a one week football camp and then at the final day we had the football tournament. Um, so the, all of this is completely free for the girls because they come from underprivileged backgrounds. They cannot afford to pay for these things. And it's also that to motivate parents to send their daughters. Otherwise, I think when money is, you know, uh, comes in, they would not like to do it for their daughters. They would do it for their sons, but not, not their daughters. This is why I try to keep it completely free for girls. And um, back then in 2018, we didn't have enough finance to provide transport to the girls. So some of the girls would literally walk for four hours every day just to reach the camp, you know, for their training and go back. And yeah, I just really, this is the, these are the kinds of things that keep me motivated and, you know, to keep working for the girls. Where are they walking from? <laughs> and are they walking by themselves? Yeah, no, uh, they walk in groups and I was also the one walking with them, but I walked Good. for around two hours. They walked, some of them walked for four hours because they came for, for, from further villages. So within Chitra, we have valleys, within the valleys, we have different villages. And this was happening in the Karimabad Valley and there are around 40 or something villages. And so like the furthest village from the camp was about, you know, four hours so. Yeah, it's really amazing how how much passion they have. 
What's your coaching team like? Coaching team as in the coaches. Yeah, so I guess with 60 girls, you must have a few coaches there and they have to get trained up. So how did you do that? So in the first year, I did not. I was the first, I was the one, you know, trying to run here and there. I was the cameraman. I was the coach. I was the water boy. I was everything <laughs> in the first year. Uh, yeah, but then the second year in 2019, I won the Nike Made to Play grant, which then helped me, you know, further bring in more better uh, facilities for the girls. We had we had transport for the girls, which was really amazing. And so we had 100 first participants this time because we had transport. Um, and then I had five, uh, four professional coaches, actually. I'm not really a professional coach, but I can, I am, I'm, you know, I know how to coach girls. We had four professional coaches, two from Hunza, two from Chitral, but they, they live in different cities. And then they, uh, they have, you know, they have the FIFA or AFC license, D license for coaching. So we had them come in and then they coach the girls for girls for eight, eight uh, days. And it just surprises me how these girls, they learn so fast. They pick up. I think it's also because they're really young. We have the age group between uh, eight to 16. And so these girls pick up, you know, new skills really fast. And yeah, I just amazing one of the things that just made me smile was to see the smiles on the kids faces from the footage yeah. of of them playing uh, with the beautiful background as well because they, they're just you could see that uh, this is the first time they're they're on the football field and that joy you know that you had that i had many people all around the world that football is so addictive so yeah. you, you'd hope it's uh, gonna create a really positive legacy in their life i like yeah. to talk about um I'd love to talk about the other sports that you've been able to bring into the program. I heard skiing is involved now in volleyball. So, yeah, each year we try to introduce a new sport. And uh, it was last year that uh, a friend of mine organized the skiing camp, which was also happening for the first time in Chitral. And I thought it's such a good opportunity to get girls, you know, to participate in it. And so we had six girls, including myself. We participated in the skiing, uh, you know, festival. And it was really amazing. And I think slowly, slowly, the, the society is becoming more tolerant towards girls playing sports. And this is exactly why I'm doing what I'm doing. And I yes, I had to face all the problems, everything. But I don't focus on the negative side of it. Then I look on the positive side of it and how things are changing. I would People would curse me on every picture, you know, two or three years back. But now, actually, people are showing more support than, you know, people are, you know, the people are showing hatred. I mean, I don't see those comments anymore. And this is such a win-win for us. And uh, we also introduced volleyball last year where we had 45 girls partic participate in the in the final tournament. In the camp, we had 20 girls. Um, so, yeah, each year we, we try to introduce new sports and then get more girls involved. And I think it's really important for health sports, especially for girls in our area because they don't really get to enjoy life. They don't. They don't get really get to enjoy life. As like you know, they start working, uh, you know, helping their parents or their mothers with household chores when they're only I think about eight or nine, and then the whole society restricts them to certain rules and customs. They can't laugh loud. They can't run. They can't you know be happy. And this brings a lot of stress into you know these kids, and then. And yeah, early marriage, childhood marriages are also some of the problems in Jitral. So this is why like, we, have, we have different uh, aims for this club and for what we're doing, that we want to physically and mentally both like, empower these young girls. I'd love to speak about AFL now. And I, I can't believe I'm speaking to you mm -hmm. about Australian rules football. I am so fascinated by how this has happened. I would never knew in, in my wildest dreams that Pakistan had a women's football team, AFL. Yeah. So the context is I'm a big Fremantle Dockers fan. So this is the AFL club here in, in Western Australia. And I like mm -hmm. to say the best team, <laughs> but, you know, they're my team. <laughs> our men's team has not been very successful, but our women's mm -hmm. team, Fremantle Dockers, women that started in 2017, I think, are actually the number one ranked team in Australia. But just before the coronavirus, wow. we had the semi-final to be held in Perth in our home ground, mm -hmm. and the season got called off just when we were the number one ranked team. 
Um, so it's heartbreaking. And I, I would love to make you an honorary fan of the Fremantle Dockers women's team if if you're open to that. Uh, sure. <laughs> sure. I just know a lot about the Western Bulldogs. I even have their jacket. But sure, I mean, I do that to keep you happy. Ah, that's cool. So t- tell me about how AFL actually uh, was introduced to you. I think it was the end of 2016 uh, or the start of 2017, I'm not too sure. Uh, but uh, uh, we have a football club here, uh, you know, in Islamabad, the Highlanders. And so the AFL president back then, he, I don't know, he named himself to be the AFL president, but he came up to our manager and he was like, oh, there's this new sport, the AFL, and there's this new, uh, you know, there's this tournament called the AFL International Cup. And we're thinking about taking a girls team. So if you have any female, you know, footballers who are interested, you know, they're more than welcome. And so I was like, okay, I, I'd like to, you know, go and see different opportunities. And, you know, I was like, okay, fine, I'll just go and see what it is. And the first day I went, it was horrible. <laughs> the girls had no idea. There's this air football and they don't know what to do with it. And they're like, oh, our hands are hurting. I don't know what this is. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, I'm not doing anything today. The next day I went with another friend of mine, Abiha, and we checked off all the videos online and we were terrified. We were like, what is this? We, I mean, we play football, we have rules and everything, but AFO, you can just jump on someone's shoulder and, you know, to grab the ball. What is, we were really uh, scared at first, of course. But then we, you know, checked for the rules and everything, and then we learned, and then the next day we went and we started teaching these girls, actually. Um, and I, I fell in love with the game, actually. It's really, really fun how free, and I don't know, it just, I, I really like AFL. I really liked it. And so we, you know, we continued playing, and then we had a proper camp where we had, you know, a selection team. And then we had uh, different girls come in and give trials. And then we formed a team uh, of AFO. And then we traveled to um, um, Australia. What's really funny is that our first game was, I think, against Ireland. And that's when we actually learned what AFO actually was. (laughs) (laughs) We thought we knew a lot, but we did not. So we were looking around like, what's going on? And then my friend is like, well, welcome to the AFL world. You know, just keep playing. And then, well, we kept, we kept playing. They're really strong. Everyone's, you know, uh, everyone's really strong, really tall. And us Pakistani girls were like the shortest and the least strong. But, but we kept fighting until the end and we loved it. And then our next game was against Canada. And I think that was a really nice game. We didn't score in the first uh, quarter and then in the half of the second quarter until the half of the second quarter and everyone was really impressed because we were playing for the very first time um but what is also really uh, uh what was really amazing was that we were told that we were the first uh girls team from any muslim country or nation you know to participate in the afl and that was re- a really proud moment so yeah it was really exciting you were the cool runnings of AFL football, you know, like Jamaica, yeah. we have a bobsled team, you know, Pakistan, we have a football team. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> Can you tell us the, the scores of some of those games? Oh, my God, no. <laughs> Can we not go there? <laughs> Can we not talk about the scores? Uh, I just I... like to say that we got the score in the last match. <laughs> it's pretty embarrassing, but we made it through. We didn't win a single game. That's what I would like to tell you. But we scored a goal, and I think that was such a big moment for us. Yeah, what was that goal like? So I've seen some of the highlights of the Canada game. Um, but oh, God. What yeah. was your first score like in AFL football for the Pakistan team? I don't know. I think we got a free kick, and then one of our friends, she scored. And we, we were <laughs> celebrating, and the opposite team was also celebrating with us. They were just... <laughs> So excited that we finally scored. But yeah, I think it was our first time we learned. We didn't know the rules of AFL. How did you learn? So were you watching a few of the games on YouTube of the, you know, some of the elite matches? What was your process? Yeah, that's how we learned. Every day we learn a new rule, go to the round, teach the girls. But it's it's really hard because, uh, I mean, female athletes here, some of them are not as fit as you expect them to be 
And so first you have to work on their fitness process because AFL is not an easy game. Like you can break your bones mm-hmm. if you if you're not fit and you know go into the ground and play against a good team. So we had to work a lot in the three or four months. Um, but still, I think we were missing out on a lot. But but then we went to Australia. We had amazing coaches, Michael Gallus. We had Vasim. They're really kind, really helpful, and they would you know always cheer for us even though we played really horrible but they still you know keep us you know he told us to keep our heads up and just keep playing and you know keep fighting and I think that was really amazing yeah you were winners so even though you lost three yeah. games it's fine you were you were absolute winners I do want to talk about some of the logistical dramas that happened for the team when you arrived in Australia because I think people need to get an appreciation of just the resilience of the team and how amazing you, your group was to deal with the things that you did. Yeah, um, so it, it also goes back to the AFL president who called himself the president, but he wasn't doing a lot. And uh, so he messed up a lot of things. Uh, he, he had communication issues with Australia. Um, he told us different things. He told us that we are going to have, you know, everything is going to be free. We're going to have a stay. We're going to, you know, go into hotels whatnot and we're like fine and then on the last day he's like oh no pay for your tickets and how we're like wait what how are we going to pay for our tickets on the last day what are you thinking what are you saying and then we had uh the current afl uh president who is um mr Tarek right now he's an amazing person he sponsored us and he was like i really want you girls to go because you have practiced you know, throughout this whole time i want you to play and you know not anyone else to go there and just embarrass us or something um so we 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 really got to go to Australia, but then the moment we were at the airport, we reached Australia, and you know the team uh, from uh, Australia who were hosting us. I mean, they were hosting us, but not in a way that they were responsible for our stay or anything. And then they told us we don't have anywhere to stay, and we were like, "What?" We had a match the next, the very next day, and we were just freaking out, like, "What are we going to do?" But then they figured out something and we had we found a place to stay. But then that night we didn't have electricity the whole night. And we, we <laughs> and it was really cold. <laughs> yeah, because Melbourne yeah, I mean, is not a warm we place. We went through all of that and we still made it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but then I think it's just we, we also then again like to focus on the positive side. And yeah, we went through all of that. But then we, we, we came out as you know, stronger, and we 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 became became bit better friends, better teammates, and we took care of each other, and we made it through, and it was also funny time. So, yeah. <laughs> What's your connection with AFL now and and footy? Is that your number one passion? How are you balancing it all with with what you're doing? I like footy, but I'm I'm I don't I mean I would choose football over it any day. Soccer, what you call it. Uh, but but yeah, I would like to continue to play footy, but there's not much happening. We had started to have different practices, different games and everything, but then Corona happened and they stopped again. Uh, for men, I think it's going really well. They're having different uh, leagues in different cities. You know, there are teams that are playing really well. And I think the boys team, they're going to have some really amazing talent, new talent that are you know, hopefully take part in the next day of a uh, cup. I think that would happen next year now. Um, for us, I think it's so amazing because we now get a chance to, uh, you know, we will have one more year to practice so that we, uh, you know, get to maybe hopefully participate in the next uh, tournament. I don't think we were participating this year because we were not so ready as a team. Yeah, unfortunately, coronavirus impacted the AFL International Cup, which was meant to be this year. So how has coronavirus affected where you are in Pakistan and life in general? Because it's very hard to keep track of what's happening in different countries. It'll be fascinating to know. Yeah, I so especially in the north in Chitral, I was there for two months, right when the, uh, you know, the breakdown happened and everyone, you know, things were closing down. I decided to move back to my hometown and I moved back in March, in the end of March, I went back. Um, but what I saw is that Almost everyone in the area had lost their jobs. They were moving in from different cities, moving back to their houses in uh, Chitral. 
a lot of the men in Chitral work as, uh, you know, laborers in different cities of Pakistan. And so they lost their job. They had to come back. And people are suffering. People are actually really worried because they're thinking about feeding their family and how they're going to do it. People are going through a lot of problems. And uh, even in the city, uh, first there were lockdowns, but then the lockdown got eased, which is causing a lot of problem, actually. The the outbreak of Corona is worse than before. We're having, you know, many, many cases, ca- cases each day. It went from hundreds of cases to now thousands of cases each day. Uh, I, I don't know where this is going right now, but I really, uh, I'm really worried for the people back home. And the people who, in general, who cannot, you know, who are really worried about what they're going to do, how they're going to feed their families, and you know, they don't have the ability or the savings that they can, you know, enjoy just by sitting home. And uh, so this uh, gave me the idea of starting a ration drive, a food drive, um, back home. Uh, I started collecting donations from friends and family, and from you know, different people on Twitter that I connected with. Uh, And I've provided ration food to uh, around 250 families now, and we're still continuing helping the families back in Chitral. Uh, And also, uh, the the local hospital in Chitral, they were facing shortage of, you know, safety equipment. So I uh, collected funds to donate safety equipment, PPEs, masks, you know, goggles, face shields, all these things to the local government hospital in Chitral who is dealing with the corona cases. Is there any way that people could support? Yes, I mean, uh, I'm doing it uh, not through my organization or, uh, or anything else. I'm doing it personally. I'm connecting, you know, collecting funds uh, and through my account, and then I'm giving it out to family. So what I do is, uh, for, the trans- for transparency, what we do is we collect the data of each family that we're helping. We have the whole data, and then we provide it to the people who have helped, helped these families. For instance, if you decide to help two families, we get all the data, their uh, you know contact, their ID, their names, and then give it to you. And then you could personally contact and you know uh, uh, c- connect with the family too. So uh, if you want to help, you can message me you know on Twitter, on Instagram, and Facebook. On Twitter, my name is Karishma Ali Twenty Two. You can you know you can message me, and then yeah, we'll go further from there. I'll put that in the show notes so people can That's log really on and great. find that. Yeah. M- moving back into the Chit- Chitral Women's Sports Club, and now that you're a football international player, an AFL international player, and then there's quite a bit more publicity now towards what you're doing, you were able yeah. to meet uh, Prince William and Kate Middleton. Tell us about how that happened. I did, and I got so starstruck, and I forgot to say hi to you know the princess. I mean, it's just because I was such in you know in such a shock. I met them, and I'm like, I, I am I you know really meeting them? Am I dreaming? But they're amazing. They're so kind, and especially you know Prince um, William. He loves sports, and he loves. Uh, women's sports and I saw him supporting the you know Lionesses team in the World Cup so I talked to him a bit more about that and we had a really fun you know conversation around that and uh, I was so happy to uh, you know hear that they had been hearing a lot about my work in Jitral uh, at that day and about myself I think it's also because they were traveling back to my hometown uh, after you know the Islamabad trip so I, I was really happy to hear that And um, so me and Prince William, we kept talking about, you know, sports. And I think they have like a certain time in, you know, a certain pace and then they have to move on and, you know, security issue protocol, whatnot. So so the 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 ambassador of UK would keep telling, you know, reminding the prince, like, you have to move on, meet other guests. But then he would keep, you know, asking about football. Yeah, it's really fun. I also want to talk about the Forbes 30 Under 30 Asia. How did that happen? Because that's such a fantastic honour and congratulations on that too. Um, Thank that's, you. Uh, that's something that must be uh, really exciting. And how did that happen? Um, my friend nominated me and I did not think I'd make anywhere to Forbes Asia, but then to my surprise I did. And I, I was really happy not just for myself but for for the girls back home because this was a moment of change and a lot of people just started telling me how proud they are of me and that they would want their daughters to be exactly like me. So this meant that people were, you know, starting to believe in the abilities of their daughters and to, to give them the freedom of choice to do, you know, do something 
and everyone wanted their daughter to be in my place. So if you want to do that, you have to give that, you know, freedom to your daughter and support them. So, yeah, it was just a brilliant moment. And now I think people in my hometown are more supportive than ever. And I, for me, it was just, just like it's a dream that I never even dreamt about. You know, it's just crazy, you know, to be in Forbes Asia. And, to you know, it's really funny. I always thought that Forbes was for rich people. That's it, you know, not for anything else. But then I was in there and my, you know, my friend kept texting me like, wait, wait, what? You're secretly rich? What is this? Like, why are you for? <laughs> no, it's not only for that. You're becoming a bit of a, a poster child for Pakistan of the, the youth. Is that what you feel? I feel like that sometimes, yeah. Um, but then, um, yeah, I, I believe, I think I, as long as it, uh, it's a positive message and it's helping people and it's, it's inspiring the youth, I think it's it's. I would love to be out there and bolster it and whatnot. Yeah, and you must be connecting with a lot of people from around the world, and and maybe Pakistan is quite misunderstood. So what do you what do you say to that? I mean, I'm fascinated by the different regions as well, and and there's so much that isn't known about Pakistan. So how do you speak to that? That is true. Uh, so a lot of people they, they mix up a lot of things. For instance, when we went to the Jubilee Games, a lot of my friends from other countries were like, "Oh, when you go back to the country, are you going to pour, put up the burqa and sit home?" We're like, "No, that's not what <laughs> we do in Pakistan. Not all of." So different regions of Pakistan are, you know, very different. The culture is different. The people are different. For instance, in Islamabad, you can openly play sports, and you know, it's accepted for for it's. Uh, people accept that girls play sports, and then you go into the northern region and end up not in WFP, it's Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. But if you go there, uh, it's different. The culture is different. Uh, and there's a lot of restrictions for women. So I mean, it's different in different places. But then again, I think our people are really beautiful, really kind-hearted, really supportive. It's just a small group of people that are like that. You know, who who want to bring you down, who want to restrict you to their rules. And I think, you know, they, they try to bring in the religion Islam and then they, they try to bring in their rules and make it look like it's the religion. Islam is a religion of peace and we, it gives women a lot of rights that they don't talk about. Are there parts of Pakistan that you wish you could travel to? It's crazy, but I've not been to Hunza and Gilgit. Most people mix Chitral with Gilgit and Hunza, but it's not the same. Gilgit and Hunza is another province. Uh, it's not really a province, but it's another part of Pakistan. And Chitra lies in KPK, though we border and, you know, uh, we have the same geography. But but I've never been there. And it's it's like a tur- tourist hotspot. It's like everyone goes to Hunza. So I really would love to visit Hunza or Gilgit someday. Uh, what do they do at Hunza? I mean, it's almost the same as Chitra. But the people are, uh, I mean, the people are wonderful. It's. Uh, their uh, literacy rate is, I think, around 98% or something. Um, and the landscape, everything is so beautiful. Actually, uh, I don't know if you're into YouTube uh, food bloggers, but I love Mark Weens, and he has an amazing series where he goes all around the world to places that aren't really on these travel shows. And he, he puts yeah. a lens on these places, and he does go to Hunza. And he yeah. has amazing food, like the, it's soul food, you know, made from the heart yeah. and yeah, uh, yeah. the street food as well in, in Karachi and things like that. So uh, it does look very fascinating. Yeah. One thing I do want to mention, because you do have so many different honours. So we've gone over the Forbes 30 Under 30, the meeting of Prince William and, and Kate Middleton, and then also the Pakistan National Youth Committee. I don't know the actual name, but... You're involved at that level. So tell us about that a little bit. So it's the the Pakistan National Youth Council. It was formed in the collaboration with the Commonwealth Youth Council. So different countries within South Asia are forming, you know, this National Youth Council. And in Pakistan, it's, uh, it's uh, led by the prime minister himself. He is the chairman. And then there's different members of youth from different, you know, backgrounds, uh, from, you know, technology, sports, social work, education, all of this. We have a group of around 32 members, really, you know, amazing people doing different amazing work in their areas, in their, you know, fields. Um, Yeah, so this was formed uh, last year, and this is the first time uh, Pakistan had formed a National Youth Council. And what we do is we help the government in policy making for youth. 
Are they looking at sports? What are they sort of looking at at the moment? They are. We haven't been doing much lately, uh, um, but we are hoping to work in future. I'll share an Imran Khan story yeah. with you. Actually, when it was in the nineties, he came to Fremantle and he was having he was having food at at a restaurant my dad was at, and um, oh, and wow. my dad called my mum and said Imran Khan is here. So mum actually, for some reason, knew him because the Pakistan team visited Fiji in the seventies. And my grandma knew him, so she took me as a little baby, and we went to <laughs> to meet him at the restaurant. And there's a photo of us. And back in the nineties, the, the, oh, wow. the Pakistan team used to actually, yeah. uh, when they stayed in Perth, they would be at a hotel next to my grandma's place, and they knew my grandma. So Imran Khan would actually not mm-hmm. like the hotel foods; so he would come to grandma's place to eat. <laughs> and wow. It's ridiculous these photos <laughs> that she'd be showing me, and and uh, you know these days it would be impossible to do because of security and all that. Yeah, but uh, yeah. maybe when Pakistan won the '92 World Cup, it was because of my grandma's cooking. That's what I tell myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> I should come here and cook more often, or you know, go to the World Cups and help the Pakistan yes, team. Yes, we'll do. You're also passionate about handicraft and the the Chitra Women's Handicraft Centre, um, also Fashion Week. You've been involved with. That's another part of your yeah. passions. I'd like to hear about that. Yeah. So I started off as a social, uh, you know, I started that off as a social enterprise because I really wanted to help the women back home. Um, Women do not get to say a lot in their homes and they don't have, uh, you know, uh, what do you say? They're not included in decision making. Just I think personally think that it's because they do not provide any financial assistance in, in the family. And that's why they're not given the same level of importance. And their life is dictated and they cannot go out and buy what they want to do. So so I wanted to, you know, I wanted to empower them in a way where they are, you know, where they're free and, you know, uh, financially, you know, equipped and financially empowered. Um, so then I, I started the Chitral Women's Handicraft Center because Chitrali embroidery is famous and these women have had the skills for years. It goes on from generation to generation. They learn from their, uh, you know, moms and that's how... Every, almost every woman in Chitral can make really nice embroidery. Uh, but the thing is, they make these embroideries, they don't know how to sell them, right? They do, they do not earn out of it. This is like really hard work of days and days, and they use needles, which hurt their, you know, fingers, uh, but they don't earn off it. So I thought of, because I'm a business student, I thought of starting the Chitral and Handicraft Center. But at the beginning, what I did was I just, you know, gave them a, 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 a place, a center, and then I gave them a machinery, this center, because... So the women can gather and they can have their moment, enjoy, have a nice about their cows or, you know, guests at home and their children. So they just come and work for one hour and then go back home. Uh, but then um, I was introduced to an Italian designer, Stella Jean, who wanted to, uh, you know, collaborate with uh, Pakistani, uh, with, uh, you know, the Northern Handicraft Centers. Because she wanted uh, Chitrali embroidery made on her dresses. So I was introduced to her by a friend of our, you know, a mutual friend. And then I talked to her and she was really fascinated by my story. And she said that I really want to, you know, work with you. And I said, okay, having zero knowledge of how to do like proper business and zero knowledge of fashion world. I was just like, okay, I said, okay. I took up the risk because I knew what it meant for the, you know, uh, artisans back home. Uh, for the women back home and for their families. So then we worked for two months uh, together uh, with the collage and with the Chetrali women. And we produced four, uh, 400 meters of embroidery, uh, uh, of embroidery on her dresses that then were taken to the Milan Fashion Week and, you know, uh, models were wearing them for, on the ramp walk. And to me, it, uh, what was crazy is that I made it to the Milan Fashion Week and then I got to walk on the, you know, ramp. And this is something that I'd never imagined in my entire life. Uh, but yes, Stella, she came, she visited Chitra, she, was, she met, you know, everyone there, the artist, and she was very happy, very touched by their stories. And then she thought, uh, you know, she really wanted me to come there to see, you know, our work and to see the work of these ladies. And because it meant really, uh, you know, it meant so much to me, you know, their work, and because it was being shown at an international stage what the skills of the, you know, what these women hold, the skill that they hold in such a far-flung area. 
So yeah, uh, it, it was such an amazing moment, and I was crying throughout the whole time. Like I have a picture in Vogue that everyone thinks is really nice, but I think it's really ugly because I was crying and my eyes are pumped, and you know. Uh, but yeah, I was just really, really proud at that moment when I saw the dresses coming on the ramp. For the listeners who love their fashion, how can they find some of those designs or even purchase it too? We were really hoping to start a website, you know, uh, uh, this year in March, and we were planning on doing a really nice project. But then because of Corona, everything got delayed. Hopefully soon we're going to start our website uh, in about August or uh, August or September. We'll start our website or we'll start uploading more pictures of our product on uh, on Facebook. It's called the Jitrala and Handling Craft Center, and then people would be able to order and you know purchase from there. Well, Karishma, it's been really fascinating to hear about the different projects you're involved with. I'm, I'd love to know what your aspirations for the future. So there's a lot. It's just that um, in about ten years from now, I just want to see more girls like like my from like myself back home. You know, working for more girls and reaching out to more uh, you know girls in different areas of Jitra. Not only in Jitra, but we want to uh, move our work to different parts of Pakistan and then you know help other people in different parts of Pakistan. And you know, in about ten years, I just want girls to see you know be in leadership positions in Chitra and you know see them making a difference then and not having to see anyone fight for their rights anymore do you have a message you'd like to leave the audience with what i you know people are always you know telling you to have realistic dreams or to you know limit what your thoughts are for the future but don't do that because when I was a little girl back in the villages of Chitra, with no technology, no television, I just knew that I'm going to do something different. My father usually would ask me what I wanted to do and I, all I would say that I wanted to do something different and make a difference and I wanted to become a leader. And look where I am today. I mean, even I don't believe it, but I've made it this far. So you struggle for what you want, you fight for your dreams and I'm, I'm sure you'll make it. Don't give up because sometimes you fight for yourself but then in the meanwhile, you're fighting for so many others that you don't know. But you will re- you realize once you reach that, you know, place where you want to be and then you see, see behind you've left a whole, uh, you know, open road for other people who want to follow you. All the power to you, Karishma. You're an absolute legend, as we say in Australia, um, and <laughs> an inspiration and someone who I really want to see keep succeeding and doing well and bringing the joy of sport to those people in your in your community and also broader than that. Uh, thank you so much for thank joining you. me on Frio de Janeiro. Thank, thank you. Have a nice day. Well, what a chat that was with Karishma Ali. Please be sure to check out the show website, abidimam.com, where all the goodies and show notes will be. Until next time, keep smiling, keep scoring.